if you could comprehend the importance of personnel, procedures, and resources when designing your legacy, I'd like to welcome back Howard Hinman, a senior paralegal, as we continue to discuss private trusts as well as different variations of trusts, such as the irrevocable statutory trust and other forms in the next 30 or 60 minutes. Welcome back, Howard. Greetings. It's good to be back. And of course, we specialize in the irrevocable common law trust. Our website is www.passingbucks.com. Basically, as the late R. Buckminster Bucky Fuller would say, a stool rests on three legs. And similarly, any well-constructed organization rests on three legs. Personnel, procedures, and resources. And if you, lose, if you have any one of those that are inadequate, the whole organization can falter and possibly fail. Yes. And that's so, simply the way to. Yes. Yeah, so one of the problems that oftentimes generations come across, whether it's brand new wealth for the first time, they've come into some money, whether they've sold a business or gone IPO with, uh, you know, their, their startup, or let's say they've done well in cryptocurrency or another avenue. So it's this idea of how do we pass wealth forward? And I think one of the chapters in volume one covers that there can be great grief when there's lack of foresight in what's called the careless dis dissipation of wealth. So I thought we might start here. One of the statistics, volume one, one of the, the books that your group is a part of, um, had mentioned a statistic that about 53% of Americans pass away without a will. But even if there is a will, that can be contested. Even minor clauses can be questioned as if a person was sane when they were signing it. So I think this is why we're continuing on with this conversation about trust, because if it's not normal parlance, a normal conversation for a person, we're trying to normalize it a little bit so that somebody won't be afraid if they sit down with another professional, whether that be an attorney, a CPA, or any other type of professional to understand more of the vocabulary and frameworks. So okay. I thought we could start here with the living will and how is a trust better and who are the, cre the key players in the trust from the grantor to the executor and okay. so forth? Hey, as I say, solely as a paralegal, not an attorney, without giving him any financial investment, legal or tax advice, or typically political or sports thoughts. Basically, you have a situation where any failure on the part of any one of those three things, personnel, procedures, and resources. Now, a living will is superior to no will, because that means you are at the mercy of the courts, literally. Uh, and it's a mess. We had a gentleman, a uh, close friend, pass away, and he had no will, no anything, and he had a car with expired tags on it. And it took over nine months to get that car out of a driveway, just to cl just to clear a car out of a driveway, because he also didn't leave any keys. The keys somehow disappeared. A single set of keys. Well, I think there's a lot that oftentimes if it doesn't go planned for, it becomes a big surprise to anyone who is living as well as to the next generation, because when the education is missing, people don't even know where to begin. Okay. So if we think about a, a, a trust, normally it's written by the grantor. Is that correct? Right. And then there's the key items. You have a grantor, also known as a settler or a creator. Then you have preferably three trustees. Three, three trustees are good. Again, we come back to that three system. We have a trust protector who in our system, as discussed in the books, The Art of Passing of the Bucks, Volume 1, Volume 2, and our premium subscription newsletter uh, available at www.passingbucks.com, uh, can be a, a bar card attorney, at least in the United States and Canada, as far as we can tell. And then you want a bookkeeper, and an executive secretary, because nothing exists as far as a trust is unless it has a minute taken by the executor executory and a financial note that is prepared by the bookkeeper. And minutes and are really important. Minutes are vital. Absolutely. I, I, I speak, uh, they de document, uh, we basically, one of the trusts, not Charles Arthur, was sued uh, by somebody who 
uh, had put money into a uh, into something, and uh, our executive secretary Gwen Wyckoff, and this did not happen on my watch, was able to show that hey. Here is the document where you knew what you were transferring, et cetera. Also, as a, a long-range thing, you are, you're doing something for your grandchildren. That's very important to understand is if you set it up in your 20s, you're looking at a 60-year payback as far as success by setting up the proper personnel, procedures, and resources. And I know that this was covered in the first episode that we did, but I just want to reiterate that the trust indenture is the source document. That is where the bylaws are written and the rules are written and the policies and everything that that grantor wants. And we're going to get in into it a little bit later in this conversation if um, there could be a little bit of flexibility so it doesn't feel like the grantor is controlling everything from the grave. But that trust indenture is the source document. Is that correct, Howard? It's important that it be designed with enough rigidity to make sure the grantor's ref uh, wishes are, are reflected and also enough flexibility to allow for changing circumstances. That's a tricky thing to the, the drafting of a tip of if a physical, dra well drafted, irrevocable common law trust, which again is our expertise at www.passbestom is going to run between 20 and 40 pages, usually 30. Yes, absolutely. One of the things, and I'm just going to read this, this is from the very beginning of chapter nine. There was a, a I just want to read this one sentence. It talks about how if somebody is not familiar with the emotional, legal, financial, and tax aspects, when an estate passes to the heirs, that is, is a really big deal. The prospective recipients need to not be in the dark about any and all issues so they don't have to bear an extra load of the responsibility to know how to take proper care of the 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 investments that get willed to them as well as income property land and so forth so this is why again we're just going to hammer in some of these points and reiterate them for repetition because this can be brand new to someone who has not grown up with trust or hasn't come across them and this might be the first time or the second time, because it takes a little while. It can take a good three to 10 years to really wrap your mind around how a trust functions. You're absolutely correct. Uh, one of the, one of the founders of this organization, Frank C. Ozak, uh, had a three year knockdown drag out battle with bone cancer. It went all the way up his spine, great tragedy. And he was prepared, in fact, that's covered, uh, it's called, the article is called Good to Go. It's on our news on our website, www.passmos.com. Gwen Wyckoff, one of our founders, wrote it. And, and even though he was extremely well prepared, it was like, gee, Frank knew how to do that. How do we do that? I mean, it, there was great preparation and still there was consternation. Well, can you imagine can you imagine what it is when you're not prepared? Well, absolutely. That's when the anxiety creeps in because people don't necessarily know through osmosis. They have to read the documents, review them, review them again, review them a third time and really understand every word that's in it. But let me talk about the benefits so I don't scare off the listener right now. <laughs> so one of the benefits is that sometimes personal control can equal personal tax liability. And again, we're not giving tax advice, legal advice or sports advice, any of those in this conversation. We're just two friends having a virtual conversation today. Um, but an irrevocable trust means that some that or use of some or many of the assets um, means that the grantor does not own them and therefore won't be taxed. They will not be taxed for them. So the assets then would belong to the trust, but are insured, maintained, and guarded by funds generated from the trust. So tell me, Howard, how come probate court has no jurisdic jurisdiction over an irrevocable trust? Because it is covered under, in the United States of America and in common law countries, it's Article 10, Article should be 1, Section 10 of the United States Constitution, the right to contract. Basically, it is a private contract. It keeps you in the what some people call the private sector as opposed to the 
quote, public sector. And that's a whole nother matter. That's something we do not deal with. We simply deal in the private. We're not into the into the public private controversy. It's not our specialty. Interesting. So is there a test by a judge or a clerk regarding the minutes or the trust indenture regarding whether or not they have jurisdiction? The, the biggest item is this, a Angela, Angelina, excuse me. Basically, w the biggest, the number one headache, and I'll speak from experience, I've not had this personally. However, I know other trustees have had this. The number one issue is the beneficiary with some kind of addictive behavior. It can be alcohol, drugs, or gambling. And therefore, the, a, a well-drafted trust of any type, solely as a paralegal, will have a spendthrift clause. And as my understanding, particularly in Santa Barbara, there are trusts that are attacked regularly incurring great expense and consternation by people who who who've incurred because these beneficiaries have incurred debts particularly gambling debts oh. it's a great it's a great tragedy you know that's interesting because there's a number of celebrities that can pass away and have airtight legal and financial documents and yet if there is substance abuse that can be quite a wrench that's thrown in. But I know that's not the topic of today, but that is a reality that's out there that oftentimes can't always be planned for. Right. And instantly, the second biggest issue, and it's covered in Gwen Wyckoff's article, I think it's what, what color colors your chariot, which is one of our premium subscription newsletters, talked about cars, trucks, automobiles, motorcycles. The, that's the second biggest issue in a trust after that. And I've, I have not had that happen. Personally, again, I know other trustees that had the issue, including a because the trustee is the owner of the of the automobile in question. Some fellow was required to travel from Carson to San Bernardino on a hot day in late July to deal with a car that an automobile that had been impounded. Oh, interesting. But I've, I, I have heard that a... While a trustee then would manage the asset of the car, that the beneficiary can drive it if it is in the trust indenture. That's correct. However, Gwen's Wyckoff's article discussing great things, it's very difficult to insure the car unless you have what's called a commercial lines insurance policy. So typically, the trustees these days will keep it in their own names. It's simply too difficult unless you have, say, a fleet of five or ten. Then you can okay. get what's called a uh, called a, a fleet lines insurance policy. Oh, that's interesting. I think Progressive Insurance also covers one-off cars. But let me ask you, what are some of the ways a grantor can fund a trust? So this is, again, is if somebody's starting out for the first time and they would like to fund their trust and open up a bank account, where do they start, okay. Howard? You want to set up given the, the the best way is you want to make a large enough investment in your legacy such it will generate a cash flow of five thousand dollars per month that will pay this benefit the expenses of the personnel and the operation expenses for some office space whatever or home office equipment etc and some of the ways uh you could do stocks, bonds, et cetera. Uh, you could do a bank account, uh, any number of, there's any any number of ways. It's a typical traditional way to start a trust is with one silver round. And my preference is the Mexican Libertad. Okay. And also somebody could fund it with a whole life insurance policy or through mutual funds. What say you? That actually, uh, there's a gentleman uh, who is no longer with us. His name was R. Nelson Nash. That's R. Nelson Nash. Nash as in the automobile, Nash automobile. And he wrote a book called Infinite Banking. And he was a in the agricultural business before he got went into insurance. And he was in a, spe a special type. He was in forestry. And a forester is looking ahead 20 to 30 years. 
In other words, you plant a, in other words, sh there are short term crops that you harvest in a year, wheat, corn, whatever. And then there are longer term crops or people doing things. You can get like residents in Nicaragua or Panama if you'll buy a not into a Nani plantation. And the longer term investment, 20 or 30 years down there, is a teak plantation. It takes 20 or 30 years. So again, he developed this thing, and it's basically you self-fund your organization. And eventually, his companies, the goal was they would be able to self-insure the, their, their fleet. Fascinating concept. Again, Infinite Banking by R. Nelson Nash. It's a, it's a book about probably 20, 30, 40 pages. So there's a variety of different ways then that if somebody would like to fund their trust for the very first time, they could choose teak wood to mutual funds, to a whole life insurance policy, to right. the proceeds of a real estate transaction. It sounds like there's a plethora of ways. Right. And indeed, that was our, our Nelson Nash's goal in infinite banking is you would set up insurance policies to build over 10, 20, 30 years, such a way that you could self-insure and self-fund the company for its expansion. Brilliant concept. Yes. So speaking of the corpus, you had mentioned that ideally at least two to three individuals need to serve as the trustees. So yes. what are some of the responsibilities of these trustees, whether they are the bookkeeper, the CPA, the executive secretary, or a bar card attorney? The bar card attorney would be the trust protector. They would they do not take part in the day to day operations. They would attend all the board meetings, and as the late Frank Ozak, to refer to Frank again, they're the natural ombudsman, and any disputes are referred to them for initial mediation. Then you have the bookkeeper who keeps the financial records, which are critical, and then you have the executive secretary who keeps the minutes and also banking resolutions, board of trustee meetings, board of trustees minutes or resolutions in lieu of a board of trustees, things like that, critical. The trustees are responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of the trust. The first trustee being the primary trustee and the other trustees supporting the trustee. The grantor, creator, or settler chooses the first trustee and the uh, and also the, prote the pr initial protector. And the first trustee chooses everybody else. That's their responsibility is that bit of personnel selection. That's wonderful. And some of the other duties could be that they would um, have to increase the value, let's say, of investments, right. uh, follow the indenture term. So we're back to that in, uh, trustee indenture, right. which is that source document, determine investments. So if they would like to um, you know, buy gold or silver or Bitcoin or any one of the latest cryptocurrencies, they could decide that. Administer distribution, handle accounting, meet and converse with the beneficiaries. What what else could come up in okay. real life? Okay, the the I've left out a key person, and this can be the the grantor, creator, or settler, the trust general manager. The trust general manager is primary responsibility. He or she is to increase the trust corpus. A very large trust, a that, that general manager is paid the 5% of the increase, and the first trustee would be paid 3%, the trustees would pay, be paid 2%, and then everybody else would get like 1%. It's also traditional to pay each person between one and five out silver rounds each year as a symbolic payment. Understood. So I have heard that the more the trust makes, the more the trustees make. In other words, it could be known as a fiduciary fee based on a percentage of the distribution. And yes, the my understand the very large trusts uh, where, where the trustees are getting the equivalent of hundreds of dollars an hour for their work are paid solely on the increase in trust corpus. Okay, wonderful. So one of the, if I go back again to the idea of 
how clear the trust indenture needs to be. One of the points of clarity would be intentions. Before I get to any uh, type of uh, verbiage regarding investments, why is intentions so important? If there ever is a dispute which gets to court, as my boss Ira Robinson would say, Howard, remember that this document may eventually be written by read by a judge who is maybe the, of less than average intelligence. It's important that we prepare it properly such as it's understood. And so it's very important that it be absolutely clear what the goal of that trust is. What what is is there some for instance you might have a trust uh i grew up in anaheim and nearby was the old anaheim cemetery and before it went bankrupt and the county took it over along with several others and of course the only the purpose of that trust was to manage that cemetery upkeep it etc etc well, so it's, it's important to be clear that it, that whatever trust is, and it could be for the benefit of cats, dogs, uh, youth baseball, youth soccer, whatever, that it be clear what the intention of the trust is. The, 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 the intention of this trust is to provide, I, I worked on a, it wasn't a trust, it was a, a 501c3 nonprofit. It was, he wanted to provide a, an, an I think it was a youth softball foundation for the city of Westminster in Orange County, California. Bingo. There is your intention. That's lovely. That's lovely. Thank you for, for providing that example. So when, if you could provide um, a scenario, when has there been a circumstance where a grantor may have been, let's say, too controlling? Because again, for somebody who is learning about trust for the first time, and I've got many listeners under age 40 that are being reintroduced to this idea of a trust. And, and maybe there's listeners out there. I think you mentioned there's grandmothers across America that love the Passing Bucks book series. So yes, it's, so, we call it. Quick aside, we call them the Rainbow uh, Book Club, and they actually meet once a week with their copy of the book, and they mark it up in various different highlighters. And this is something that I can sh say from personal experience: Gwen Wyckoff actually discourages people from doing. And this is a not a nice thing that's going on. Let's identify it and bring it out and take it by the head. There exist, and you can find them on the on the web. There are court cases which specify that you will be disinherited from the trust, which is really sad. But keep going. I know this was talked about. If if you marry a Jew, that has happened, or you are not permitted to sell the property to a black and i know that the, 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 those have been upheld <laughs> and I, I it again i i per, as an objectivist i personally disagree make sure that's on the record however that's over control in my opinion so it's a paralegal that's over controlling i think it's more important what is the character of that person rather than their race or their religion yeah, I, I did come across uh, Gwen talking about that. And also if there is a clause within the trust indenture, let's say that the beneficiaries or any member of the trust cannot invest in competing uh, products or services. So inst for instance, if they're the main uh, income source, let's say is oil, this is just, I'm making this up. It's just an example. Um, the beneficiaries cannot invest in, let's say something that would compete with the main profit line or they could be disinherited. And so it, it is alleged, and I have no we, proof. We won't name any names. <laughs> that certain very wealthy families in the Northeast of the United States that have exceedingly large trusts, uh, based in what you just described, have are forbidden from investing in what is called breakthrough energy and the best website is uh, e-cat www.e-catworld.com because they would compete with the revenue stream from oil and gas that has been alleged i have zero idea if it's true yes but i think if i were to circle back to what you were talking about before um and i think this is what one of the conversations that did come up with with gwen that it wasn't racism per se if it's written in the trust indenture that the members, let's say, 
had to, like you had said, they could only hire or marry a certain type of person. And then character is not so much at the forefront, but rather what's written, written in the trust indenture, even if it may not be ethical or moral. But if it's in that trust indenture, it, it brings up kind of a sticky conversation because talk about difficult conversations, because then as that trust is passed forward, will there be the room to amend it in minute, minutes at meetings or is that written in stone? At some point, let me give you an example. Uh, there were in from the 1920s to the 1960s, so, 1960s, and tragically, the last one I've heard of this, I think we may have an article on this. If not, let me, uh, Roy Rogers, Dale Evans, the uh, uh, about in Apple Valley, California, had a clause in their, one of the, de the developments that's saying that Orientals were only allowed to live in the servants' quarters. Asians, there are, Asians. It, it was Asians. Okay, uh, Asians. Yeah. Whatever one. Okay, and there was folks from the Far East. Except, yeah, we were, you know, of, of Far East descent. We're not allowed to live in anything except the current quarters. Uh, I am probably my 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 natural father was was half American Indian, as far as we can tell. And when after my mother's death, we looked at the whatever, and. He could not legally have lived in that house. He kept his American Indian ancestry secret. Uh, that existed uh, 19, late 1930s. Dr. Richard Feynman, the famous Nobel laureate physicist, 1965, uh, his book was Surely You're Joking, Dr. Feynman. When he went out in the, and he he went out in the 19th, late mid 1930s, and in New York City, it was signs of uh, Jews not hired. So, in, so and 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 uh, my my dentist uh, Dr. Lauren Friedman back in Los Angeles, excellent dentist, I recommend her. She was looking as like it was, we're not allowed to lease you this except they're going to. By that time, it was it was ruled as being contrary to public policy, and that is actually when the judge is going to step in. Wait a minute, this is over the line. So, okay, so, so at, can... at some point, at some point, that the the grantor has said something that that there actually will be a judge stepping in solely as a paralegal. Okay, so let's say that section and that clause is unconscionable. How, what other remedies are available? Let's say if there is a grantor who is controlling too much from the grave <sighs> through that trust indenture, are there any other remedies, or does it come down to the judge, Howard? Oh, you, typically. As long if solely as a paralegal, my understanding is under the probate code in most states, if all the beneficiaries and all the personnel of the trust will agree, the trust may be amended. If there's wait a minute, guy, in a situation which the grantor was either foolish about or did not foresee, everybody is agreeable. May we, um, may we, under these circumstances, get a court imprimatur to amend the trust? My understanding is that has on rare occasions happened. Okay. Well, good to know that there's remedy. So all the grandmothers across North America who are reading <laughs> these books with their highlighters can now know that there is a remedy because sometimes there can be something and at that time, it may have been culturally acceptable. But in today's day and age, in the year 2023, yeah. times have changed. And it's just different. Even in the South, there are certain, I think that's like, uh, they talk about certain uh, rules and laws written on the, in the blue books that somebody can't drink alcohol, let's say on Saturday or a Sunday, or they can't do business on Sunday. It's very interesting. So uh, let me give you some personal examples. I have a relative in Colorado. And in Colorado, there is there are no liquor sales no they they can sell beer i think about on a sunday so they per person realized that they wanted something and so they went up to the first town in wyoming to buy a, a bottle of wine so they could put it in the dish for supper uh, i i know that uh, in like kansas and texas you cannot sell alcohol before like uh, it's either 11 o'clock or one o'clock on a, a Sunday. 
some place. And of course, some counties in Kansas are still dry. And that's why liberal Kansas gets its name because it was the, the one wet county for a whole bunch of counties around it. Yeah. And, and I just want to bring up again, before I move on to the next question, that the reason that we're talking about this idea of when the grantor can control too much from the grave is because when there are families of multi-generational of multi-generational families of wealth, sometimes that next generation can feel that they're walking into a situation and their hands are tied. And if times have changed and they would like a little bit more freedom regarding who it is that they can hire, who they can retain, who they can marry, again, what is that wiggle room so that they can know their rights and remedies? Because okay. in private international law or private contracts, sometimes they can feel as if there's no breathing room. All right. Let me make one more point and I'll answer your question. At one time, somebody was told in the South that they could not start their sporting event before like two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. And it was on going to be on national television. It's like, what well, you know, the, the network wants to broadcast this at one o'clock. What do we do? So I they work for faith something. It's important again, I go back to the earlier point. It's important that the trust indenture, the document be written with enough specificity to uh, make sure the grantors it wishes are made and enough flexibility to allow for change circumstances, etc. That's that's the critical. That's why drafting of legal documents is an art. How to do that. It's to get all the little nuances. Uh, if you can do that, you're doing great. Yes, yes. So speaking about word magic, about a century ago, irrevocable common law trust was the most common trust to use. And if I could refer to Appendix B of Volume 1, and if there is any listener that would like to purchase your books or the books of your organization, there will be the websites in the show notes. There are 16 different types of trust. So what one of the points I wanted to bring up in chatting with you today is that I think it's so interesting that trust most closely designated to this irrevocable common law trust, they're also known as dynasty trust, mega trust, or super trust. What I find so interesting, since 1913, people have fallen away. Why do you think this, this is, Howard? Is it the lack of education, the lack of training, or people just taking shortcuts? You know, what's going on since 1913? <sighs> One, I'll wildly speculate to some extent. Basically, uh, an irrevocable common law trust is in the common law and is a creature of contract. Anything that's statutory is a creature of statute and is subject to the whims of the courts and the legislature. In other words, it can be changed at any time. Uh, or somebody, whatever. Uh, essentially, it's a irrevocable common law trust, in my opinion, as a paralegal, is a superior form to provide the personnel, procedures, and resources to assure your legacy. Okay, and that's wonderful. But tell me, riddle this to me, Howard, why in the last century, since 1913, a century and a decade, about why, why do you think people aren't learning about the right personnel uh, and, and retaining the personnel, the right procedures, the right everything and going and, and falling back to, let's say, a grantor trust or a living trust or doing less or not getting three trustees or cutting corners with the minutes? Because this subject really is not, as far as I know, is not taught in law school uh, in you get environmental and riparian law is probably the is is more common and i have been told that a very large law school was told if you even offer this subject as an option you will never get any more federal funding of any sort for your entire university the i it appears and this is speculation that there's a concerted effort to keep this knowledge restricted to a few high priced high powered trustees and law firms primarily in the northeast of the united states and toronto canada that would be toronto boston new york city 
uh, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. Yeah, that's my where... uh, that's my that's my understanding. I do not know if that's true. I have only heard that. OK, so I so I can exclaim out speculation. <laughs> yeah, I, I, w wild speculation. <laughs> and you can yell out, overruled. <laughs> <laughs> no. <Okay. laughs> So I just want to, just for the, the the sake of uh, clarity, I just, if it's all right with you, I just want to name out some of uh, the trust in Appendix B, maybe to whet the appetite of any listener out there that is curious about this subject. And maybe they are an attorney and, and this was not covered in their training, or they are a next gen family member that wants to have their full due diligence. So again, I'm just going to read quickly from Appendix B. Um, there's dynasty trust, also known as legacy trust, and as well as mega trust and super trust. Uh, that's number one. Number two, there's educational trust with use of gift and lease arrangement. Number three, generation skipping trust, which our favorite entity, the IRS, knows about. One could speculate. Number four, life insurance trust. Number five, Medicaid trust. Number six, public charitable trust, number seven, rabbi trust. And I thought this was interesting. Members of a synagogue provide a retirement benefit for the rabbi. Uh, moving right along to number seven, special needs trust. Number eight, sprinkling or spray trust. Nine, term trust. And last but not least, testamentary trust. And I thought we would just skim the surface so that the listener can know that there's more than one, but, but your preferred might be that irrevocable Common law trust. Um, let me make a comment about the rabbi's trust because it's interesting. A rabbi's trust is the name of a trust given for a clergy person's retirement fund and is thus named because it was first used for the benefit of a rabbi. In other words, it could be used by a member of any denomination as it happens. The first one to do it was a rabbi. Okay. Is there, in your uh, view, is there a main difference between a private trust and an irrevocable statutory trust. Yes, and I referred to it earlier. A pr a private trust, a legacy trust, dynasty trust, and irrevoc the irrevocable common law trust is a creature of contract, and any statutory trust is a creature of statute. Okay. Okay. So, since I I think I might name this podcast episode "Trust Not for Everybody" in being a little bit. Uh, spicy, <laughs> a little bit provocative. There are seven scenarios, Howard, when one perhaps should not get a trust outside of a grantor trust or a living trust. Would you talk to me for a moment about these seven scenarios? And I thought it was interesting that the book covered something called, and we're just going to be politically incorrect right now, the white man's disease. And I thought yeah. about a particular politician, and we're not going to name names, but I thought it was so interesting because I think he doesn't trust anybody, but we're not going to bring up his name because there's, I'm sure, more than one politician that might not want to delegate to uh, one, two, or three trustees to handle their yeah. business and legal affairs. But what are some of those seven scenarios? Well, let's focus on, uh, there is uh, government wages probably are not appropriate unless after tax. For trust, we have IRAs, which are covered in a, in a different, in com different type of trust. Uh, W two wages. Uh, these, our trusts are really primarily for people like farmers, ranchers, and small business people. That's the, that, that, in other words, people have that. There are ways to do it. If you're a quote unquote employee, you, you start smaller, and you might want to do it in conjunction with several people. Uh, we have uh, retirement funds. Covered by different a different type of trust, and they're creatures of statute, and there's federal and state regulations on that. Uh, professional licenses, again, that's a creature of the of the state. In other words, a, a if you're a bar card attorney, the bar association owns it, and they can take it away from you. Or if you're an accountant, that's why we prefer the term bookkeeper. Uh, and of course, if you're not sure of it, do not do it. And the greedy is basically. As Gwen Wyckoff would say, and I have said in my videos, the purpose of any trust is not taxes. The purpose of any ta trust is to provide benefits for whatever, whoever the beneficiary is going down as far as the trust can, can continue. It's very important that the, the, that the grantor be willing to share to build greater wealth. 
Yes. Recently. Yeah. So, so I think what you're pointing at is that if the main intention is just tax avoidance, it needs to be more than that in the vision of the grantor and the members that are coming together as the collective. Yes. It's, it's all, it's all about the beneficiaries and privacy. Yes. That's Although I, I did think it was interesting. And, and again, I'm being saucy here regarding what Gwen and some of the other contributors, I don't want to call them authors, wrote about no. what they called the white man's disease. And I just thought this was interesting because it, it, it pointed the flashlight for a moment to an individual that did not want to share and did not want to give as, uh, you know, there's this idea of service to self versus service to others. And it's this idea of the mindset of an individual who, who felt that they would, and I'm not sure if it's a scarcity mindset or if it's just that they want to take everything with them and no one else can have any enjoyment. It's all theirs. <laughs> that is a psychological situation that probably neither you or I are qualified to comment on. <laughs> yeah, I just find it so interesting because sometimes wealth, like many other um, situations, can just bring out more of the personality of that individual. So if they're already generous, they'll be more generous. If they're already stingy, money just makes them more stingy. Uh, it's interesting. One of the classes of people in around the world that can go from rags to riches will be sports personalities. And Will Chamberlain apparently did not change his personality. However, he always wore some kind of a wristband or ankle band to remind him that he came from very humble roots in Philadelphia. Uh, uh, the late, um, not, not, excuse me, not late, uh, the gender changed Bruce Jenner. Now it's Christy Jenner. He basically, uh, I think his wife's name was Christy or something. Oh, his wife is uh, Chris Jenner. Yeah. 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 Oh, the, 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 the whatever. Uh, he was v very frugal apparently and billy jean king uh the tennis player was also very was a very frugal person oh interesting that interesting. That, 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 did, that didn't that didn't change oh yeah what a learning journey the things that yeah. that money can bring out if they're already yeah. there it just shines a bigger <laughs> flashlight on them okay yeah. so one of the things i just want to touch base quickly on this is if somebody does receive w-2 wages they could assign or, or they could use those funds to buy stocks and then assign the stock portfolio to the trust so right. again Stock, I, so stocks ahead. stocks bonds uh etc yes there are ways there would be ways to do that there it was typically you would start smaller and it's it's sometimes better if you would have several grantors and build a legacy a legacy pool because remember the goal is to get a cash flow of five thousand federal reserve notes in the united states and you adjust depending on whatever your uh, place you are to uh, other common law jurisdiction appropriately to get the operation going so five thousand a month to start to pay the uh, trustees and so forth wonderful so I, i'd like to talk about community property as we kind of close out our, our conversation in the final nine minutes or so I found it so interesting that sometimes community property can supersede an irrevocable trust agreement or another scenario where there's what if there is a wealthy parents and they oppose their children placing assets into a trust. And, and I thought, wow, isn't that interesting? So parents can tear apart a marriage and where the attorneys get paid. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? So when it comes to things like community property or if there's already agreements in place, a trust can throw a, a wrench into that. Am I correct? Right. Uh, there's an old saying, and forgive me any attorney, or, or pardon my Swahili, any attorneys listening to this, bar card attorneys. One attorney in a town does not make a good living. Two civil attorneys in a town make a living because they sue each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's an old joke. In any case, yes. In our, solely as a paralegal and without giving too much away, it's necessary to split the community property before it's placed into the trust. In other words, you actually take it out of community property and then the, if it's a husband and a wife situation or whatever, uh, they each put their property in separately 
and that's properly documented. And what was the second part of your question? I just found it so interesting when wealthy parents, let's say, um, they can take the assets and say, congratulations, children, adult children, adult offspring. The assets are now, uh, they, they belong to a board of trustees or to a trustee. And, um, or in the contrary to that, the, the wealthy parents could oppose their children placing assets into a trust. And I didn't realize, again, how spicy this uh, topic could be. Uh, and this, again, goes back to the Santa Barbara situation where the trusts are often attacked, even though there are spendthrift clauses and trustees spend and, and per, trust personnel spend a gr great deal of, amount of resources and time dealing with it. If there is any type, you want, the goal of a trust, a properly structured trust, is to stay out of the courtroom. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You, you, you want the, the goal of a trust is to operate privately, effectively, and efficiently to build the corpus for the benefit of the beneficiaries. Sure. Three generations, six generations, nine generations, and on and on by retaining that right talent, the personnel, and having the right procedures and so forth in place. So as we draw to a close, what else can a reader learn from these two books, Howard? Because passing on a legacy is property and assets and money, but it's also more than that. Do you have any closing thoughts for the listener? Yeah, in those books, and of course, our website, plus the premium subscription newsletter, great value, $80 for a year, uh, comes out every, year, every month, usually on the 1st, never on April 1st, always April 2nd. Mm -hmm. Basically, what you are doing is setting up a legacy of continued success. That is your goal. And that's what you do. Because we all hear the occasional horror story of the trust fund baby that didn't turn out as well as we would like. However, 98, 90% of trust fund babies turn out fairly well. You hear about the exceptions. You do not hear about the, the trust fund babies that did well. The person that had the personnel person, uh, procedures and resources to get a leg up. For instance, Frank Ozak suggested, hey, we can afford to fund you and have you start working, whatever, 16, 18, and give five or six different things a shot, maybe with even the even in the, in the trust or someone what you know. And by 18, you picked a major and you have a, an interest there and you do not spend your 20s wandering. You know, by 25, you're you're doing well. And the, the book has an example of a fellow uh, that was a, a, I think it was a trust fund baby, that he was a doctor and then he set a situation that his son became a doctor. And that's great because we could use more good doctors. Yes, yes. And and I just would like to also add that I think one of the uh, key strategies also that was added to the book outside of just uh, wealth and property and assets was a point that Gwen made about sometimes families can break one another and they don't even realize that they're doing that. And she goes into a little bit more detail about how families can sometimes not psychologically and emotionally break one another, but rather be a healing force to collaborate well and to work together and to be very aware of the communication styles when they have to disagree and how so also how they speak to each other, how they relate and how they approach conflict because conflict is inevitable, but, but family members do not have to break one another. And I think in terms of the unit of the family in the world today, not just North America, but in the world, I thought that that was also a, a tangible point to add to the overall value of the two books. You can choose your friends. You are stuck with your family even that fifth cousin, wherever, who everyone is a wee bit ashamed of. <laughs> That's lovely. That's lovely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, sometimes blood is thicker than water and sometimes family. It can be the greatest blessing, like you had referred before to Kris Jenner. And I think about how well the Kardashians have worked together. All of those young ladies as entrepreneurs out there, they really... You know, whether you like them or you hate them, they knew business well and to collaborate in business. And I think to myself, 
I, I wish more families, when I think about women in business, they uh, they did a great job. Um, and also just this um, idea of, um, yeah, blood is thicker than water, but uh, you definitely want to get along with family because you want to make it through those holiday meals. <laughs> that's true. And go to them because that's the way you make sure you can include them. In Incidentally, a person, and I do not know what their estate planning was, uh, Harris Jenner, I mean, not, not, not Paris Hilton, whose uh, great grandfather was, of course, the famed Conrad Hilton of the Hilton Hotel, Hotel chains, and then Baron Hilton, her grandfather, uh, who was the founder of the Los Angeles Chargers, and I think he was with Vita Packed Orange Juice. In any case, she comes from wealth, and she's had her ups and downs. However, she seems to have settled down. Yes. And she's certainly a lady. She's one of those ladies who's actually, she was, I think, the first lady who was simply paid for appearing as an influencer. And, and I think she's doing some things lately on Capitol Hill, like regarding child abuse, given what she went through uh, growing up in some of those um, schools that she had to go to in Utah and some other states in her documentary. So she's she's done good for her life today. Yeah. And yeah. she's only like 40 these days, I think, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So she's actually at at four at at forty. She's doing fairly well. This is good for her. Oh, well, good luck to her. Yes. Um. Any other thoughts before I read out my closing paragraph, Howard? <sighs> it has been my pleasure. You ask wonderful questions, and again, it's all about the beneficiaries and privacy. This is not about the T word, and it's providing a legacy an enduring, successful legacy for yourself and your posterity. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Howard. And I just want to say thank you before I read out my closing paragraph. We set the intention at the very beginning that if the listener could comprehend the importance of personnel, procedures, and resources when designing their legacy, how much more prepared they will be. And I hope that that will be the final thought right before I read out my closing paragraph. So thank you, Howard for this virtual conversation that was not legal, financial, sports, or other type of advice. <laughs> okay, all right. So in closing, I'm Angelina Carlson, the hostess of the Design Your Legacy podcast, as well as the founder of the Legacy Planning, a boutique coaching firm based out of Beverly Hills, California, but international in those I coach. I hope to dive deep into subjects that can help a person define, develop, and execute their legacy and continue to scour the landscape for those who can be great resources to every dimension of your legacy. For many listeners, there can never be enough education and preparation in the mood or moat around your castle. Whether you find yourself with new wealth or generational wealth, may the content on this channel be an anchor in any storms ahead. We do our best to provide original content for your intellectual and emotional curiosity. Thank you so much for joining us today. And remember, I coach people on the subject of their personal legacy. So thank you for listening. If you're tuning in on Apple Podcasts, please remember to rate and review. Or if you're checking us out on YouTube, please remember to like and subscribe. Thank you once again for joining us this week. And thank you, Mr. Hinman, for speaking into your legacy. Thank you so much. <laughs>